Uh, I'm Mark Tessie Levine, and I have the privilege of serving as president of the Rockefeller University. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, you all here to celebrate the 12th annual presentation of the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize, an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. Your presence is a wonderful show of support for this important prize established by Paul Greengard and his wife, Ursula von Reidingsvard, uh, and other generous friends of the university. As many of you know, when Paul Greengard received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 2000 for his crucial discoveries about the brain's biochemistry, he and Ursula decided to use the Nobel winnings to establish the Perlmeister Greengard Prize for Outstanding Women Scientists. Paul and Ursula's incredible generosity then inspired other friends of the university to support the prize's endowment. Paul believed, and continues to believe, that the scientific community has failed to publicly recognize female scientists at a level commensurate with their contributions. He was determined uh, to use his international stature to address this problem head on by creating an international science award for women. The prize is named uh, in memory of his mother, Perlmeister Greengard, who tragically died giving birth to Paul. The Perlmeister Greengard Prize honors women who have made major contributions in many different fields, including cancer research, immunology, genetics, biophysics, neuroscience, and others. Their discoveries are among the most remarkable of the past six decades by anyone, female or male. Tonight, we're here to honor Dr. Helen Hobbs, the recipient of the 2015 Perlmeister Greengard Prize. Helen was chosen by the members of the Selection Committee, a group of distinguished scientists that includes five Nobel laureates. I'm honored to serve on this committee and invite you to refer to your program for a complete list of the members. On this special evening, I'd also like to recognize two organizations that have helped extend further the impact of this important prize. They are WISER, Women in Science at Rockefeller, and FACES, the Female Association of Clinicians, Educators, and Scientists. These groups hosted, uh, hosted uh, Helen for a discussion this afternoon with some of our young women scientists. Uh, and we at the university celebrate and encourage such meetings as we redouble our efforts um, to close the gender gap in science. Before I introduce the, our presenter this evening, I'd like to take a moment to recognize Paul Greengard as he is set to celebrate his 90th birthday next month. Paul is one of those inspirational researchers who seems to have boundless energy and enthusiasm for his work. He's at the forefront of his field. He still heads one of the largest labs on campus, actually the largest lab on campus. And he's tireless in his efforts to support women researchers. In fact, more than half of his members, of his lab members, are women. For these efforts, Paul was selected as a 2015 recipient of the Louise Hansen Marshall Spe Special Recognition Award from the Society for Neuroscience for supporting the professional development of women in neuroscience through his tremendous mentorship and, of course, the establishment of this prize. Congratulations, Paul, on these incredible milestone achievements, and thank you again for everything you do for Rockefeller and for the scientific community, and happy birthday. And now, uh, it's my privilege to introduce our prize presenter, Rachel Maddow. As you know, Rachel is the host of The Rachel Maddow Show, a nightly program on MSNBC where she provides commentary on news of the day and interview with leaders in politics and culture and other public figures. She received a bachelor's degree in public policy from Stanford University and a doctorate in political science at Oxford University, which she attended as a Rhodes Scholar. Prior to appearing in the evening lineup at MSNBC in 2008, uh, Rachel was a radio host at Air Amer America, which she joined at the launch of the station in 2004. She's also authored uh, the book Drift, The Unmooring of American Military Power, uh, a New York Times bestseller in 2012. Rachel has received numerous awards, including the Walter Cronkite Faith and Freedom Award, the John Steinbeck Award, and two Gracie Allen Awards. Her show on MSNBC has been nominated twice by the Television Critics Association, for the Outstanding Achievement in News and Information category. And in 2010, the show took home an award from the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. We're very grateful that Rachel has found an alternate host to fill in for her show this evening so that she could be in, in, uh, with us here uh, on this special occasion. So please join me in welcoming Rachel Maddow to the stage.
it is a little bit um, strange to hear one's sort of lists of accomplishments and awards in this context. You know what I'm saying? Like, television critics award is like, that's, that's really awesome, except when you're in the room uh, of, that is filled with people who are you know, most likely to cure cancer. Slightly humbling. Uh, but Dr. Tessia Levine, thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you for the uh, gracious welcome to Rockefeller. Um, this is a, a humbling setting, and this is intimidating company. I am grateful for the opportunity uh, to be part of the celebration and the presentation of this award. Richard Engel is grateful for the opportunity to host the Rachel Maddow Show tonight from Paris. Um, as to my own academic background, um, as Dr. Tessier Levine mentioned, um, I do have a, a DPhil in politics from Oxford University. I have to tell you, though, that in the field in which I work now, the only people who call me Dr. Maddow uh, mean it sarcastically. Um, <laughs> they pronounce the honorific with profound sarcasm as a way of making fun of me. So this is therefore sort of nice uh, to step out of my anti-intellectual rough and tumble professional life and to be in a room here full of, uh, I would say, probably mostly women, uh, where if you don't know exactly how to address somebody you meet tonight, your best guess is to call her doctor or something and you will probably be right. Uh, we all know the history of this award. We all know the basics, at least, of the scientific legacy of Dr. Paul Greengard, which cut the path to where we are tonight. Dr. Greengard, of course, pioneered basically our, our human understanding of the nervous system at the molecular level. He turned protein and phosphoprotein abnormalities into our first window into the biological bases of everything from uh, Alzheimer's to addiction to Parkinson's to depression. Somebody like Paul Greengard has earned his name on all of these buildings. But when Dr. Greengard is written into the history of science, that will be just part of how he is remembered, and just part of what he is credited with. Because he has another equally great professional and I think ethical legacy, which is his choice over and over and over again to use the leverage and the platform, and the money, and the respect, and the deference, and the sheer persuasive strength of his standing as a great man of science on behalf of the great women of science. And men don't generally do that. Not just in science, but in every male-dominated professional field, women tend to swim this stream ourselves. And my living experience of feminism is that while we all swim this stream ourselves, feminist women try to help each other when we can. And specifically, we try to force down the kinds of systemic barriers that we find that are susceptible to pressure. But not all of those barriers are susceptible to pressure, at least not in the short term. And so progress in male-dominated fields is very, 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 very slow. But in that context, men, particularly very successful men at the top of their field, they have every luxury in the world to not worry about that, let alone to make it their own cause. But we are here tonight because Dr. Paul Greengard and his wife, the artist Ursula von Reidingsvard, they, they made what really is just an exceptional decision to use their power for good to use their power in the world, and particularly in the world of science, for good. And we talk about that as generosity, and the prize is named after Paul's late mother, and we understand that to be the story of how we got here tonight. But there is something at a human level that's just very moving about them having made that decision, having made that priority. Nobody asked them to do it. It was what seemed like the most important use of that opportunity to them. And I, I find that very moving. And they have changed the incentives. They have expanded the realm of the possible for top flight women research scientists. And it's worked. I mean, over the past decade, over the past 12 years, what the Perlmeister Green Guard Prize has done is move the ceiling for women in science. It hasn't removed the ceiling, but it has moved it. And that is really something. And so I'm honored, I'm honored to be here. We all are. I'm grateful to the very distinguished members of the Perlmeister Greengard Prize Selection Committee for inviting me to participate in the presentation of this year's award. I also, of course, want to offer my congratulations to Dr. Helen Hobbs, 
on this recognition of her important work. You'll have a chance to hear more from her yourself, but Dr. Hobbs is the Professor of Internal Medicine and Molecular Genetics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. She also is an investigator at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Dr. Hobbs also, I understand, recently won what's called the Breakthrough Prize, which is a new prize organized by internet zillionaires. And as, as I understand it, winning that prize uh, it involves a lot of celebrities and tuxedos and rap stars and comedians. So we don't exactly do it that way here, but mazel tov. Um, <laughs> and we hope you've recovered. <laughs> so one way to win the genetic lottery in life is to be born with a particular gene mutation. That means you are bad at producing a particular protein, a protein called PCSK9, which sounds to me like a defense contractor who trains bomb-sniffing dogs, <laughs> right? PCSK9. I'm sure it exists. It's probably a no-bid contract. Uh, in reality, though, PCSK9 is, is, is a protein which is directly associated, as I understand it, with the bad kind of cholesterol. So it's a direct relationship. You have more of that kind of protein, you have more bad cholesterol, more of a chance of having heart disease. So again, in terms of luck or really high-level skills at choosing your own biological parents, if you do not produce that protein because you have a genetic mutation that inhibits your production of that protein, lucky you. You win. Thanks be to God. But if you do not have that gene mutation, thanks be to Helen Hobbs, because her discovery of that link between bad cholesterol and that protein and that gene means, ultimately, that there are now new FDA-approved drugs that basically aim to mimic the effect of that gene mutation, to inhibit the production of that protein, and thereby bring your bad cholesterol levels down to the levels at which they hopefully will not kill you. And I'm sure I got some of that wrong. <laughs> um, but that's my political science PhD understanding um, of just some of the breakthrough research that led the Green Guard Prize Selection Committee to honor Dr. Hobbs today. And, you know, that's kind of a stunning breakthrough. And the, the work it took to get there, I'm sure, is complicated and painstaking and time-consuming and collaborative, and it's a push-me-pull-you, and you don't exactly know where you're going to get there, and you don't know until you're there that you are there. But the breakthrough in the end is big enough that it makes sense in big, simple terms, even as explained by a middle-brow cable news host. And it's also a big enough breakthrough that it is saving lives in the world right now. And as somebody whose academic and professional expertise is in politics and not in hard science, it is really heartening to be able to describe such pure human progress. Because in the world right now, progress feels hard to come by. Internationally, in terms of what's in the forefront of our minds right now, in the front pages of our newspapers, and in our hearts, and in some cases in our nightmares, I mean, if you're an optimist and you think of humanity's march toward progress and dignity as being two steps forward, one step back, even if you are that kind of optimist who thinks about our efforts toward progress in that way, I think you still have to concede that on that human march, we are in the one step back part right now. The death toll in the Paris terrorist attacks on Friday now stands at 129. There are so many serious injuries among the several hundred other people who were wounded that that death toll is expected to rise possibly considerably. The law enforcement response we see in hundreds of police raids in Belgium and in France and in other countries across Europe. The French state of emergency that apparently is now going to be extended for months, that will streamline police accountability and protections for civil liberties to the point where, for example, there will, there will no longer be judicial warrants issued for police actions and searches. The military response we have seen already in the increased pace and the increased aggression of airstrikes against ISIS-held territory in Syria. After making a determination that ISIS was also responsible for the downing of that Russian passenger jet over Egypt, Russia today not only increased its airstrikes against 
Syrian territory. For the first time, Russia started shooting cruise missiles into Syria from submarines. And this is something that they had tested before, but today marks the first time Russia has ever fired sea to air to land missiles from submarines in wartime ever. So as a news host, it's my job to make things like that understandable, to explain things well and fairly and in terms that make sense and in terms that make you want to consume more news and information, not less. Even in times of generalized despair, I think of it as a civic responsibility and my own professional goal to present the news in a way that makes people not want to shut it off, to not despair, to not grow so cynical that we retreat from knowing about the world. And that's true on everything that I cover, but explaining the role and the challenges of our country in wartime and in the world, and for good and for bad, that, that is my real passion. And so that puts me in sort of a weird place because as a woman and as a liberal, it is unexpected and I think sometimes unwelcome in my field that my main area of interest is national security and military affairs and the politics of war. But that is who I am. And all women working in male-dominated fields know that there's no one secret to thriving and winning in a profession where in any given room on any given day there is somebody who is seeing you at your professional best who nevertheless still thinks when they look at you that your highest calling should probably be to try to help a man reach his full potential in this field. There's, there's no secret, there's no one weird trick to defeating that. But naming it and making fun of it when it happens and confronting it, it at, it at least helps. In my field, I have found that women come interview with me because they want a job, but men come interview with me because they want help from me with their careers. I mean, I don't mean to be weird about this, but there's a, there's a whole corner of the building in which I work that has my name on it. I do work in this like tiny little specific niche of the news business, but it happens to be one niche where I literally put my own name on my own show and on the mugs and the t-shirts and everything. Uh, and I run a huge staff and I have complete editorial control over what I do. I'm, I am in my field, I am not a secretly powerful middle manager. I am the name on the plaque at the elevator. But still, <coughs> 19 year old, male pages and interns will come to my office, walk right in and tell me they'd like to sit down and talk to me about their career ideas and their plans, bounce some stuff off me, because it'd be good for them. And I'm sure it would. <laughs> but it's interesting. I've had this gig for eight years now, and that is the most specifically gendered phenomenon of my corporate life thus far. No young female intern or staffer has ever, ever done that, let alone expected it. And I have, without being asked, offered help with their careers to female colleagues and coworkers when I can do it, but I find that women generally don't want it or they're suspicious of the offer. It wouldn't occur to them to accept because women in male-dominated fields are really used to getting it done on our own. So, I mean, make of that what you will. But honestly, bottom line, here's to women getting it done however we get it done. Here's to anybody getting it done when we're talking about the kind of unqualified, inarguable, clear progress that we honor tonight. Achieved by brilliance and luck and persistence and pushiness and support. And here's to the men and women who have, through achievement and through selfless activist effort, gone out of their way when they didn't need to, to make a better, flatter playing field for research, for science, for the progress of human endeavor. If women and girls are going to contribute our half to humankind's potential, we do need mentorship and we do need advocacy. We do need confrontation sometimes, sometimes on our own, sometimes on our behalf. 
We do need champions like Paul and Ursula have been in biomedical research. But we also need stars. We need women who win by hook or by crook. We need women heroes who do previously unimaginable things, who answer questions that nobody else could answer except, except them. We need people like Dr. Helen Hops, and I am honored and very humbled to be here to help celebrate that fact tonight. Dr. Hops, congratulations, and thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, for that, those inspirational words and uh, that call to arms. Uh, and now I'd like to say uh, a few more words about uh, Helen Hobbs, uh, the, our honoree this evening, and, and add to what uh, Rachel has already said. Uh, you've heard how Helen is on the faculty at the University of Texas Southwestern uh, and an investigator with Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Um, like Rachel, uh, she graduated from Stanford University, uh, where she started by focusing on art history, but soon found herself lured by the beauty of biology. Uh, medicine struck her, I understand, as the most social of the scientific pursuits, and she earned, earned her undergraduate degree in human biology and then attended Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine. She completed an internship in internal medicine here in New York at Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, then moved to her current home in Dallas. She served as chief internal medicine resident and completed a fellowship in endocrinology at Parkland Memorial Hospital. Today, Helen is a physician uh, and geneticist who divides her time between the clinic and a robust research lab where her work illuminating genes that impact blood cholesterol levels and fatty liver disease is ushering in revolutionary therapeutics, as you've already heard uh, from Rachel. She's co-founder of the Dallas Heart Study, one of the largest multi-ethnic population-based studies into the biological factors that influence cardiovascular disease. Participants in the study provided clinical and genetic data that led to transformative discoveries about this protein PS PCSK9 that we'll discuss further and its role in cholesterol regulation. Uh, and we'll uh, be discussing this uh, in just a few minutes uh, together with Helen. She's received many accolades uh, and awards. She's a member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, the Association of American Physicians, the National Academy of Science, and the National Academy of Medicine, among others. And in addition to the Perlmeister Greengard Prize, she's the recipient of the American Heart Association Clinical Research Prize, the Heinrich Wieland Prize, the 2013 Passero Foundation Award in Cardiovascular Research, and again, as you've just heard um, last week, a 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences. We're also delighted that Helen's brother Fritz and sister-in-law Linda um, are here to share in this occasion. Now, in a few minutes, uh, I'll talk with Helen about her career in science uh, and her science. But first, please join me in welcoming Dr. Helen Hobbs to the stage. And Rachel, will you also please join us? So it's my pleasure um, to read excerpts from the citation that's being pre presented this evening, and, and Rachel will as well. Uh, Dr. Helen Hobbs, you're being honored for your groundbreaking discoveries in human genetics, which have had a profound impact on science and medicine. By showing that rare genetic variants can play a significant role in common illnesses, you've greatly enriched our understanding of inherited predisposition to disease. Your work has paved the way for new classes of medications to prevent cardiovascular disease, while providing an innovative model for the study of numerous other health conditions. You've won our deepest ad admiration for your uncommon insights into key questions that biomedical investigators hope to solve in the post-genomic era. It's my honor this evening to present to Dr. Helen Hobbs the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize. It is an international award recognizing outstanding women in biomedical science. On behalf of the very distinguished selection committee of the Pearl Meister Green Guard Prize and all of us here today, we congratulate you on this award. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hi. It's so nice.
I'm deeply honored to be this year's recipient of the Pearlmeister Green Guard Prize. And I want to briefly thank a few people. Uh, first, the selection committee. I am, I am greatly, I greatly admire the women who have received this prize before me, and I am thankful that the committee thought that I was worthy of standing in their company. Thank you very much. Second, I of course want to thank Paul Greengard and his wife, Ursula. As a mother of two sons, I'm particularly, I find it particularly poignant that the prize is named for Paul's mother a woman that he never had the opportunity to know. And yes, as a mother, I ache for her loss, not seeing her son develop, and yes, not seeing him win, the, to be awarded the highest honor for any scientist, the highest honor in the world for any scientist, and that is the Nobel Prize. But what's remarkable is how he and his wife have taken this sadness and transformed it into something so joyful and to honor women in science. And as you've heard, this is, a, uh, a, this is well worth honoring and well worth paying attention to since at most institutions, only 10 to 15% of the senior scientists are women. That remains true to this day. Finally, I want to thank you, Mark, and I want to thank the Rockefeller University and the Women in Science group and all the people that contributed to making these two days so special for me and for honoring not just me, but all the women in science. Thank you very much. First of all, congratulations again, Helen. Thank you. Thank Secondly, so nice. uh, I've, I've never felt so intimidated to be interviewing someone than in the presence of Rachel Maddow. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll try to do my best here, but uh, if I start uh, flagging, maybe she can step in. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so, so. <laughs> Let's start with your decision to study medicine. We heard that you were interested in art history. Tell us about your decision to study not just biology, but medicine, um, and uh, becoming a scientist. And, and beyond that, how you became interested in the field that you're working in. So I think that um, my interest in medicine started when I was a, not, well, actually, it didn't, my interest in medicine didn't start when I was a young girl but it was first brought up when I was a young girl. My father watched a lot of TV <laughs> and we were watching a show about Russia and on the show, I was seven years old and on the show uh, it said, they said that 70% of the doctors in Russia were women. And my father turned to me and said, Helen, I think that would be a good career for you. Women are natural nurturers, and I think you'd be a good doctor. What I heard, that's what he said, but what I heard was, I'm worried. You're so tall. You're so gawky. I wonder whether any, you'll, anyone would marry you. You have to have a career. <laughs> Honestly, that's what I thought. <laughs> but I was only seven, and I remember it. And then I went to a terrific high school. I actually went to an all-girls school. And at the end of my time there, I certainly was strong. My strongest uh, areas of study were math and science. And at the end, one of my teachers said to me, well, what are you going to do with your life? And I s told her, I said, I love science, but I just can't imagine myself as a scientist. If I, I really didn't. I had never... I had never uh, interacted with any scientists. I didn't know any scientists. And what I pictured was 
being alone with test tubes and a white coat on in a closet. That's what I, that's what I imagined. And I just thought I'm too social a beast to be a scientist. And, um, and, but she said to me at the time, well, have you ever thought about medicine? And again, and I, and I remember thinking, well, that would be interesting. Maybe I should think about that. But I was really interested in art history. I, went, I actually spent my first year at University of Pennsylvania, and I spent a lot of time uh, in, the uh, in the museum. They have a great museum, obviously, in Philadelphia. And, but I realized, I was, as I was writing a paper about a painting, that I didn't want to be one step removed from the process. I didn't want to be the critic. I didn't want to be analyzing. I wanted to be doing. I wanted to be making it happen. And uh, again, that's a, you know, I, don't, I feel like I'm putting down art historians, and I don't mean it that way. I just realized it wasn't the right thing for me. And uh, when I moved to Stanford, I started studying biology. And I took all my pre-med courses, but honestly, I took everything else. I took the flora of the Santa Cruz Mountains. I took the uh, introduction to Chinese art. I took uh, a lot. I did the humanities honors program without doing the thesis. I really had a fantastic education, but I figured I was going to be a physician, so I would take them. I just took what was required for uh, my, the scientific requirements. And then I ended up coming here. I, I ended up going to medical school, which I enjoyed. I ended up deciding to be an internist. I came here to New York City and met my husband, who is a Texan, and we went back to Dallas. And I finished my training in internal medicine, and I was incredibly lucky because my boss was an amazingly interesting man. His name is Donald W. Selden, grew up here in Coney Island, trained at Yale, and at the age of 35, drove down to Dallas, Texas. And uh, he, um, he spearheaded the medicine program there. And he uh, asked me what I was going to do with my life, and I said I was going to be an endocrinologist. And he said, I really think that's not the right thing for you. You need to go into a laboratory. I said, uh, and then he, and he directed me to the laboratory of Brown and Goldstein, Joe Goldstein, well known to people here at the Rockefeller. And uh, he basically told me, get the best possible training you can get. And in Dallas, Texas at this time, that's the best place to go. So I went from being a uh, physician to going into a laboratory, the most difficult transition of my life, but also the most exciting and interesting because I just learned so much in a very short period of time. I had to make up for a lot of lost time and I, and I spent four years solid in the laboratory. So that's my story. So, so you learned to like the white lab coat and, and the closet. Is that, is <laughs> I learned that, to like, well, all science is, all, as anybody, the scientists in this auditorium know, it's nothing like that. In fact, science is incredibly social endeavor. First, you run a laboratory, and you have all these relationships, which are wonderful, with, with young people, with uh, students, uh, medical students, graduate students, with postdocs from all over the world. And you have this scientific family, and they stay with you in general for you know, three to five years. You really get to know these people. And, uh, and you watch them develop and, and, and get better and, and become independent. And then you get the pleasure of seeing them, visiting uh, them wherever they are and where, almost wherever you travel, at least now. I'm 63, so I'm old enough to have, like you, do, you have, a whole slew of people around the world who I've trained. So uh, it, it's really tremendously gratifying to, to have this big community. And then you have your colleagues. Many of my colleagues here, some in the front row right here, you, uh, that uh, you get to know so well. And again, they're all over the country. You're brought together because of your love of science. And you get to uh, see each other at meetings. You get to go to university. One of the things I love to do the most is people invite you to go to a university. And all day, you go from room to room, and you hear that person's scientific story. It's exhilarating. You go to a great place and you have a day where you see you know, seven or eight people and they tell you their best story. 
and you're there and can ask any question you want. And if you love science, it's a wonderful experience. So the, the, you had a misconception about science totally. not being a social yes. activity when in fact it is. Maybe it's a, a message we need to get out to other high school students. Well, be. I think that's true. I think there is this terrible misperception about science. And, and I think it is something we all need to we all need to do a better job in explaining what a uh, incredibly interesting, exciting, uh, and and uh, social endeavor it really is. Before we move on to your science, can I, I just want to pick up on one other thing you mentioned earlier? You went to an all girls school. Yes. Uh, was that important in your development? Do you think? So I went to the public schools in t through the eighth grade, and then I went to the school called Concord Academy. Now it's now it's co-ed, but at the time it was it was all girls, and it was fantastic educational experience. It was a very intense, uh, very uh, rigorous academic program, and uh, but there were no prizes, no you know recognition in that way. But uh, the, the had fantastic teachers that took tremendous interest, personal interest in uh, all the students. And I think that for me, it was a, uh, it was very hard. I don't think I was able to replicate that experience, that educational experience until I went into the Brown and Goldstein lab. To, sh to have the combination of the intensity, the purity of the, the uh, love of knowledge, and of learning coupled with the, an environment that was rigorous, but also in which that you knew was uh, the, the ultimate goal was for you to be everything that you could be. That was a, you know, what a great time in my life. So let's turn now to your, your scientific career as you, you established your own independent lab and um, you set up to start the, the Dallas Heart Study in 2002. Yes. So tell us a little bit about what you did, why, what was novel about this compared to what had been done previously, mm -hmm. and, and what you had in mind when you set out to, uh, yes. with this study to crack open some of the, the biology of cardiovascular disease. I wish I could tell you, Mark, that I did this because I had a vision. That's not what happened. <laughs> The head of cardiology at Southwestern, a man named Sandy Williams, very, very ambitious man. And there was a foundation called the Ro Donald W. Reynolds Foundation. He made his uh, money in newspapers, wanted to give money to one center in the United States to support cardiovascular research. And it had to go from genes to populations. Well, in Dallas, we were pretty good in genetics. We'll, and we have very good scientists, basic scientists, who work on the cell biology of, the, of, of, of myocytes, the cells that make up the heart, that work on development of the heart. We have good clinicians, but we had nobody who did population-based research. We didn't have any population studies like the Framingham study or lots of other studies, famous studies. We didn't have that. Sandy Williams wanted this grant. It was $6, 000, $6 million a year for 10 years. That's the most you could have it. They said that at the outset. He wanted this grant. He came to me. I had been collecting families. I had been collecting DNA from families that have either high, too high or too low cholesterol. I've been doing that and been working on and found genes that are, were responsible for those elevated or reduced levels of lipids in the blood. Anyways, he came to me and he asked me, would you help me do this. I said, no. I just got into the Howard Hughes. I just found two Gs. I was totally into my science. And I, uh, and I really wasn't interested in writing another grant. And I left his office. And he came back a week later. And he said, Helen, UT Southwestern has been great to you. It's been a great. <laughs> institution to you. They've really supported you, supported your career. You owe it to UT Southwestern. 
I can't believe he was so smart because I felt it and I did it. And I had to write this grant with a, 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 a man who um, named Ron Victor and the two of us had to write an epidemiological study. I didn't do epidemiology. We used to laugh. We don't know how to, we don't know how to spell epidemiology. We had to design a study. And it's called the Dallas Heart Study. And the two of us got together and late at night, because it was the only time we had was late at night to do it. We started thinking about, okay, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it right. We've got to design something that we want to be a part of. And that was the Dallas Heart Study. So the whole idea of the study was I was interested in genetics and finding genes that contribute to disease. So the design features that we agreed upon, first, that it would be multi-ethnic. We wanted to take advantage of the fact that in Dallas, we have three major ethnic groups. We want to take advantage of the genetic diversity in our own community. We didn't care where we found a sequence variation. We just wanted to find it. So we designed the study. The oldest population in the world is the one from uh, the people who are, who are, whose uh, descendants are in uh, Africa. So half of the population is African American, and a third, and 15% Hispanic, and the rest were uh, either uh, of European descent or, or uh, with a, a few American Indians, a few Asians, a few other people from other, uh, 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 other ethnicities. But so that was one thing. The second thing is we, anything we measured, we had to measure as precisely as we measured things in the lab. In the lab, we're very precise. So if we were going to look at the heart, we had to look at it using the very best imaging technique. If we were going to look at the liver, we weren't going to use a sonography, which gives you kind of a white cloud. We were going to measure it, and we used this method called proton magnetic resonance spectroscopy, a method that we had to set up, that we had to, to test in animals to develop a very accurate measurement of the amount of fat in the liver. Everything we did had to have an internal standard and had to be up to the standards of whatever I did in the lab. And the third thing was, there's no way as a geneticist I was going to do studies on individuals and not have access to their families. As a geneticist, the best way to find out about whether a gene sequence variation is related to what, what we as geneticists call phenotypes or a level of cholesterol or heart disease or whatever you were looking at, is to look at the family. Does it follow, does that gene mutation follow the disease in a family? So we had every person uh, agree, well not everybody, 99.5% of the people that entered our study agreed to be recontacted so that if we found an interesting sequence variation, we could go back and collect their family. And then the last design feature, which turned out to be, uh, to, to be beneficial for my science, was that we focused on sequence variations that you heard about that are a low frequency or rare. And those variations tend to be associated with larger phenotypes. As a, that is larger changes in whatever you're measuring. And as a scientist, that was really came out of being a scientist because we know, that's what we look for in science. We look for big effects. We look for big effects because then we're really sure that the thing that we're looking at is actually having the effect. It's much easier to, to, to tease out and figure out what's responsible for a big effect than for a little effect. And this was at a time when everyone was doing what's referred to as genome-wide association studies, GWAS studies, looking at lots of sequence variations that have very modest effects that are, are frequent in the population. They're frequent in the population because they don't have much effect on whatever they're influencing. So those were the design features. We presented it to the, uh, and remarkably, we were, we were awarded the, uh, the grant, and uh, in Texas, there, even all the Texans were very proud because we beat out, you know, Johns Hopkins and Harvard and Stanford and, anyways, and uh, so. <laughs> but, but who's counting? Oh, yeah, yeah, but who's counting? Yeah. Anyways, okay. so, uh, and, we, and we kept that grant for, for, for 10 years and, and 
Sandy Williams, I told you, is a very ambitious man. You'd think after he got the grant that he would stay in Dallas. No. He went to become dean at Duke uh, ten, uh, 10 months later. And he had promised me when I agreed to, to be co-director of the grant that I wouldn't have to do anything administrative. <laughs> so he reneged. Completely reneged. And I honestly, I, you know, just so mad at him. I was so mad. <laughs> Obviously, I got over it. And actually, I learned so much running that project. It was a huge project with 50 people all over Dallas knocking on doors, getting people to enter the study. I learned so much about how to um, run something uh, bigger than my laboratory. And I also learned a lot about, uh, about other kinds of science that I didn't really know or understand very well. And I have to say, it was a great thing for my science. I found a whole series of sequence variations that uh, were the start of what, for me, were really interesting stories. So you, you stack the odds in your favor by designing a study where it was very quantitative, right. enriched for families, right. and then you looked for extreme phenotypes right. and tried to then link them to very specific genetic variations. So Totally right. right. And so tell us about some of those discoveries and, and tell us about PCSK9. I will. So one thing that Mark brings up that I didn't mention is he's totally right. So I did not, so for most things, you know, the bell-shaped curve. Well, the interesting things, not to say everybody isn't interesting, but the interesting thing to a geneticist are the ends of those curves. Because they're the clue when you deal with the ends of the curve, you can get at key proteins and pathways, key genes, key proteins and pathways. So immediately, we focused on the, the ends of the curves. And um, we showed, before we worked on PCSK9, we showed that when we sequence genes that uh, at the ends of the distribution of a, a plasma lipoprotein, that we could find genes that contributed to the levels of that uh, lipoprotein. So we showed that in normal individuals from a healthy individuals from a population, now we all know this, but at the time it wasn't clear, are riddled with mutations that contribute to traits, some of which uh, promote disease, some of which promote health. And we did not discover PCSK9. That was discovered by a group in France. And, but we recognized, nobody knew, it, it was discovered by a group in France who found families that had very high cholesterol and they had mutations in this protein called PCSK9. We, uh, we were very interested, but we were busy. We had our own things to do, but we were watching this story unfold. And actually somebody here at the Rockefeller played a major role early on in, in this story, and that is Jan Breslow. And they, nobody could figure out. This was a protein that nobody had linked to cholesterol at all. But they couldn't figure out what does it do, how does it change plasma cholesterol levels. And a hint came from the studies. I don't want to go into them all. I don't think anybody no. will be interested. We don't have time. Uh, whatever, whatever. There was a hint from the work of other people. And so we thought maybe this protein, since certain mutations in this protein cause the cholesterol go up and other mutations in the protein that kill the protein, maybe that'll make the cholesterol go down. And for those who are interested, I'm actually going to talk about this tomorrow morning. At any rate, and so we simply, we did one, a very simple experiment. We sequenced the, the, this, the gene in people who had the lowest cholesterol in the Dallas Heart Study. Again, these are healthy people. And we sequenced the gene in our two largest groups, in the whites and the blacks. If we had not sequenced the blacks, I would probably not be here today. I hope I would be, but I might not be. And that is because in the blacks, it turns out one out of 50 have a mutation that inactivates this gene so that these people have 50% or lower amounts of, of this protein in their blood. And Ra Rachel, you've got it completely right. High levels of this protein are associated with high cholesterol levels, 
low levels of this protein are associated with low cholesterol levels. We went out, collected the families. There were 33 people in Dallas, 33 African Americans in Dallas who had this mutation, we went out and collected the families. And as luck would have it, we found somebody who had no PCSK9. And her plasma LDL cholesterol level, normal is you know, 100 to 120, her level was 14. So this is, was important too because a person with no PCSK9, what did they look like? What does, you know, what, if, a, if a, somebody's, a drug company is going to think about targeting a drug and particularly uh, a protein that not that much is known about, they want to know what's their threshold? How low can they make this protein go before there's a problem? And it turned out that this woman, we brought her into the clinic and she's very healthy. I have brought her in on two occasions. And we've done imaging studies of all the organs that make PCSK9 completely normal. She is uh, of normal intelligence. Uh, she's a college graduate. She, uh, the PCSK9 is expressed in the cerebellum, which is your where you control your balance. She's an aerobics instructor. This was very good news. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, at least to the age of 42, she's, she's healthy and well. So um, based on, and then we showed, we went into another study and asked a very simple question. If you have this mutation or you don't have this mutation, over a 15-year period in this other study, did, who got heart disease? We compared the people with this mutation and without the mutation. And there, in the, amongst the African Americans, there was a 90% reduction in heart disease in the people that had the mutation. There were a sufficient number of those people in the study to have a significant reduction, so 80, a 90% reduction. And we found a milder mutation in the uh, individuals of European descent. We also looked at that. There, a 15% reduction in LDL cholesterol caused a 46% reduction in heart disease much bigger than you would have expected. If you took in the statin trials, a 15% reduction in LDL cholesterol would re reduce heart disease by 15%. We were seeing 46%. And we now know the reason for that is because these people have had lower cholesterol levels all their lives. It's not what your cholesterol level is today. That matters. But what really matters is what were your arteries exposed to? It's the area under the curve. It's the cholesterol, your cholesterol level times the number of years you've had that cholesterol. So these people, from the time they were born, had much lower cholesterol. So that's why they're protected from heart disease. And I should say, they had a high risk factor burden in this study. Over 55% 55% had hypertension, 25% diabetes, a third smoked. So lots of risk factors, but they did not get heart disease. So it showed that LDL cholesterol is, we knew it was sufficient to cause heart disease, but you also have to have a certain amount of it in order to get heart disease, except for under very unusual circumstances. So, so let's dial ahead, and, I'm, and we're going to open up for questions in, in just a minute. But the, the, uh, so you have these individuals who have defective PCSK9. Associated with that is lower cholesterol and a lower risk of heart disease in spite right. of other risk factors. Right. So everybody got interested. The pharmaceutical industry got interested, as you say, to try to make drugs to lower PCSK9 in people who have normal PCSK9. Right. Antibodies are made, and there are now some that are approved by the FDA. Right. So tell us a little bit about the, the clinical picture there with these drugs that have just recently been approved last August. Right. right for the first ones. Right. And, uh, and what we know about what they do to LDL cholesterol, first of all, whether this benign side effect profile that you talked about also is true of these drugs, and um, what do we know about outcomes? Does it affect... Uh, uh, cardiovascular risk. Okay. So, uh, yes, as Mark alludes to, uh, there now are antibodies that you inject uh, every two weeks against PCSK9. PCSK9 circulates in the blood. And these antibodies bind the PCSK9 so that the PCSK9 uh, uh, is no longer active. So it simulates having a mutation in the gene. And, uh, and at first, people thought, oh, people won't like giving themselves injections. But in fact, that hasn't been the case. And a lot of patients, of course, have injections because, of, uh, because insulin. And so there's a lot of experience. In, and they've developed these pens that make it easy to give yourself uh, shots. And 
for some people taking pills every, they'd actually prefer giving a shot than taking pills every day. There have been a myriad of trials, lot, uh, thousands of people that have been put on these drugs. They're not without side effects. There are some side effects. Some people get uh, inflammation at where they have a uh, duty injection, but that's very unusual compared to other. It's, it's unusual, but still occurs. There is uh, a slight increase in what they refer to as neurocognitive events, and some people have a little memory lapse. And, uh, but really, this all needs to be studied really systematically. People, I, I treat a lot of people who have high cholesterol, and, and one of the things that some people say is that statins also are associated with, with, uh, with uh, defects in memory. People swear by it that this is true, but in studies where it's been studied uh, systematically, that has not been borne out, so it, we have to find out but really need to know, need to see, we're talking about a drug that people are going to take for the rest of their life, probably. So really need to know what's the long-term safety of these agents. And we, it looks very promising, but we don't know yet. And the other thing we don't know, we know that it really lowers cholesterol. It's dramatic, 60% reduction, 70%. So 50 to 70% reduction in LDL cholesterol. And, and, and these are people who are on maximum tolerated yes. statin dose, so they've yes. lowered their cholesterol as much uh, as they can with all, statins. Yes, it's additive with statins. It's additive with statins. And the FDA now has approved it for two indications. One is for people who have a genetic form of very severe hypercholesterolemia. Uh, and uh, those individuals who often we can't get their LDL cholesterol levels low enough with statins. And for people who have... Uh, heart disease or high risk factors for heart disease, and we cannot lower their LDL cholesterol, some of these people are people who don't tolerate the statins. And, and about 10% of people who are given statins do not tolerate the statins. It's, it's kind of tricky because some of those people will tolerate it if they're given statins again, but there definitely is a percentage of people, and probably some people in this room who don't tolerate statins. And yet they have a heart disease, and they have a high cholesterol, and they really need their cholesterol to be lowered. So those two groups are the groups that are allowed to get the drugs now. It's not wider, uh, 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 they're not more individuals. They, the FDA has really limited it for, uh, uh, because we still don't have an outcomes trial. What's an outcomes trial? We have to give the drug to a group of people and not give the drug to another group of people and see whether it really lowers heart disease. Are there really fewer events? We're waiting. We need to know this because sometimes labs look good, but you don't get the, what you expect to get. That is that we expect, based on everything we know about LDL, that it will protect from heart disease, but really have to wait for those trials. And those will uh, read out the end of 2017, and beginning 2018. And so that really waiting for that. And in the meantime, you know, there's a lot of discussion about these agents because they're expensive. They're expensive and, uh, and people are really nervous about the impact on uh, the cost of health care. And this is all being sorted out right now. And, and, and I'm sure some of you have read some of the stories. So we'll have outcomes data within two years. These are yes. trials involved tens of thousands of patients. Tens of thousands of right. individuals, hugely expensive trials. Right. So, that, so that's, but we, but we should have a definitive answer yes. one way or the other. Yes, in, in absolutely. Years. Right. Absolutely. And why are these trials so important? Just to give you an example, there's another class of drugs that lowers cholesterol, raises the good cholesterol, lowers the bad cholesterol, but Lily just had a drug that was that they did, a, they did an outcomes trial, everyone thought that this, well, not everyone, but most everyone had thought that these agents would lower heart disease. They didn't. That's why it's so important that uh, we have these trials. I think two reasons. One, we have to really show that we're lowering heart disease, and two, safety. Longer period of time for people to be on these agents, be really reassuring to um, physicians and patients who are going to take these drugs. 
So Helen, I, I want to open it up for questions now. And uh, I mean, there's so much more to talk about because PCSK9 is just one of the genes as you have identified. Cholesterol is just one aspect. Fatty liver disease is another uh, in, interest of yours. But just the arc of going from the, the basic genetics, the population studies, to seeing those findings built upon to make drugs that lower cholesterol and we'll see in a few years what, what, whether they have a benefit in terms of cardiovascular outcomes must be just extraordinary. So, but, uh, but let's, let's open it up for questions. Hi, Helen. It's Betsy uh, from Doris Duke. Um, could you comment how being a um, physician has affected your science and how being a scientist has affected your clinical work? Well, that's an interesting question, Betsy. Betsy is, uh, had a, uh, I'm, Betsy and I have worked together on the Doris Duke Foundation. And one of the things that the Doris Duke Foundation does is support physician scientists. And I've been head of their scientific advisory committee. And, uh, and I think that being a physician for me, it, it's been really central to the kinds of things that I choose to work on. If I'd taken another route, it would have been a different thing. But for me, it's, uh, it's, it's something that I've utilized to be able to select the kinds of things that I work on. But most importantly, one of the problems with physicians who are scientists is many of them don't spend enough time in the laboratory and don't get the a rigorous scientific training, which you have to have to be able to tell a complete scientific story because you have to be always learning in science that's always changing. You're, the technology is changing all the time. So you have to really feel comfortable developing new methods and uh, doing new kinds of experiments. And to be able to do that, there are some people that are just naturally uh, gifted and, and seem to be able to do it. it uh, but for most people, for almost everyone, it really requires uh, extensive, uh, rigorous uh, training to learn uh, how to do that. And, and I think that that is something that uh, really trying to impress upon young physician scientists. It's gotten much harder now as physician scientists because uh, there are a lot more is demanded of them clinically. You have to be protected, you have to be protected for, so that you have time for your laboratory. In this day and age, there's a lot of stress on uh, medical school education and the humanities, but you're ahead of your time because you already had your background in arts history. Um, would you say that that kind of helped propel your research at all in any way? Honestly, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it made, it's, it's fantastic for my life. It's been a tremendous source of pleasure. Uh, you know, I, I, I studied literature in college. I read, I love novels. So what, you know, for the, all the readers out there, I, everybody knows what, you know, how pleasurable that is. And art history, just to give that as an example, just brought me so much pleasure of being, a, when, I, when I travel, going in to, to museums and seeing interesting art. And one of the things we have that's, that's uh, uh, really nice in, in Dallas and Fort Worth is we have great museums and great exhibits and, and I get tremendous pleasure. So, uh, but does it actually help my science? No, I don't really think it does in any direct way. It would be very, uh, I'd have to really, it'd be an obtuse connection. Maybe it helps me when I'm, you know, designing my slides. I don't know, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay, great. Thank you. Get another question here. Yeah. I think it's fabulous that Rachel Maddow is here to participate in this event because I think one of the really important possibilities is getting us to Rachel Maddow. How do we get more science and more women in science in front of more people? And uh, is that important? Well, I think it is important. I, I actually do think it is important. I never, well, I was saying this today at lunch to the young scientists that I talked to. Besides one attending that I had at Columbia, I really didn't have women to uh, model myself. 
on. And, and I think it would have been, I, I think it would have been really helpful for me to, and maybe earlier in my life, I would have gotten into science and, and that would have been great to have a better background than I have in science. I really started late and, and I, I, I wish that there was more, um, I mean, events like this, events that are showcasing scientists. Uh, we, somebody, uh, Mark mentioned the Breakthrough Prize. I mean, that, what, what was really fantastic last week was uh, that women in the audience came up and had their picture taken with me because they wanted to show it to their daughter. That's great. And, um, and hopefully the experience, uh, I, I know that that is the desire of the people who organized the Breakthrough Prize is to showcase scientists. And, you know, as a woman who has received that prize, and, and, and Corey, and, and you have two women right here who received the prize too, we're all committed, strongly committed to promoting women in science and, and celebrating the women in science. We've heard about all your successes. Have you ever had a baby with the bathwater event which discouraged you in the process? Okay, so this is, I, I'm not telling you part of the story. <laughs> and it's a daily story, I have to tell you. So, at least for me, um, the science has really got its ups and downs. There are times where it is really hard for me, it's really hard for me to, because uh, sometimes experiments just are not working or you're setting up an assay, it just, you can't see, you try everything, change every, you know, every, uh, you try every buffer that you can think of trying, you, 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 and, and just nothing seems to work. All your ideas that you think are so great when you do the experiment, they're wrong. I mean, that's reality. And most of what you do, most of the things you test are wrong. And I, have, I used to have a whole lot of trouble with those down periods. And one great thing is I was very lucky that I had the chair of my department, Joe Goldstein, when I'd be in one of those periods, I'd sometimes think, well, am I really doing the best thing for me to do? You know, here I'm having all this trouble going through this really dry spell. Maybe I should go do something else. I go in and he'd say, Helen, just get back to your lab. It's just because you're not interested in your science. Just keep working and something will happen. And that's really was great advice. You just have to persevere and get through those dry spells. And, and, and so definitely that's happened and they're, and there are certain things I, it, that there are certain part, p pieces of the scientific stories that I've told that I that oh, that I've wanted to tell that I haven't been able to tell that I've had to give up on trying to tell because I just couldn't figure out a way to break through and 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 those stories are still I still want to tell them and I'll be someday I'm going to open up a journal and somebody else will tell a story I really wanted to tell. And I'll tell you, that is really going to upset me. <laughs> I'm not going to be happy woman. But that's just part of it. And I think that in science, you go through these periods. I, I, I compare it to surfing. You go through these periods, you catch a wave, you find something. You know, when we found PCSK9, we knew right away. We found something very big. And that was a wave. Telling that story was really... There were so many experiments that we did, and we had so much fun figuring out what this protein did and why we were seeing what we were, do we were seeing. But then the story starts to, you know, and then we got stuck on something. One of those things, I, stories I wanted to tell, I, I just couldn't figure out how to do, and I had to give it up. And meanwhile, you, you know, you start looking, thinking, looking back for the next wave. What are you going to, you know, what's the next thing you're going to do? But sometimes in the period, you're in the white water, and you're, just like surfing, you're just, you're not going anywhere. And that's, for me, very hard. For other people, they're more patient. I'm just not that patient. As you've said, the women scientists in leadership roles and in tenured faculty roles are few. Um, even fewer than that, though, are 
female scientists in those roles with children. Tell us, tell us how you did that. Well, first, I had my children, uh, I had both of my children when I was doing my postdoctoral fellowship, so when I was in my training. And one really great thing about science compared to when I was uh, uh, doing medicine is you can schedule your time. So I could schedule the time that I worked in the lab. So even though you work a lot of hours, you can schedule the time. So, um, I, and I was very lucky. I had a woman who uh, came to my house and took, she started coming when my first son was two weeks old and she stayed with our family until he was 21. And one of the reasons why I think she stayed was I let her have the house. I mean, when I left, I did not micromanage her. She didn't have to fill out a schedule of every little thing that my sons did. And I, I trusted her. I mean, of course, that trust had to come. It wasn't the first day. But, um, and, and, and so, uh, and, and because it was expensive and because I was making very little money, uh, we had another family who dropped their kids by our house, so we shared. And then we had a set schedule. I got up very early in the morning and went to work, and my son and my husband got uh, the children up, two sons, and um, he, uh, and then I came back, and the medical students and graduate students used to call me Manic Mama, because I'd be doing my experiments, and then I'd have to be, my, my, the, the, the woman who took care of our, my children left at 5.15. I had to leave at 5.05 to get back. And if I hit too many red lights, I might even be a little late, and I couldn't be late. So, um, so that's what I did. And I, I worked on Saturdays. I've always worked on Saturdays. And why do I? And then my, my kids went to my mother-in-law. That was great. She, it was great for them. It was great for her. And, uh, and it worked out well for me because it was a downtime. It was a time when I could really think, time for me to have uh, really, um, and it still is a really great time for me in the lab, time for me to have more time with, the, uh, with particular people in my lab if they're having trouble. So I've always done that. And, um, and then the other thing I did was I was always the stay-at-home moms that my kids went to school with. I oh they were uh, they were always in debt to me. If I was in town, I drove everywhere. I drove all the children. I was like the carpool mama. I drew them. I, I took them everywhere to every soccer game, to every practice, so that when I was out of town and I needed help, everybody wanted to help me because I. That's how I worked it out. I mean, there are those. I'm just giving you some of the details. It's not perfect, and I will say this, I said this today, this is not true of a lot of other scientists, perhaps more gifted than me. That, but for me, I ha, you know, if you really looked at the trajectory of my career, I, uh, I, re, I really treaded water for a period of time because you only have so much energy. And you have to make choices, and for me at that time, I, you know, I did enough to keep in the game, stayed in the game. And then um, when my children uh, uh, got older, I had so much energy because I had, you know, I managed so many things. I multitasked and gotten so efficient at everything that when uh, I didn't have so much to do at home, I could pour that energy into the lab and, and, and it showed in, in, in the output. Well, Helen, thank you so much for this wonderful, thank you. wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. And if you, play, you stay seated. People are standing. Oh, thank you so much. No. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.